sorry I, I covered a lot but anyway there's so much of videos of this i've done uh, recorded and already thrown in i'm doing this especially for uh robin brother pratyusha how are you you're back in bangalore no you're still in us Uh, hello, Pastor. Yeah, um, we, I'm still in US. I'll be here for another two months. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Yeah, 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 we are all fine, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Give my regards to your parents and your brother. Yeah, sure, sure. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. All right. So now I'm going to show you something that I, I, I was doing for... How many of you here attended the GCN conference? Anybody here attended the GCN conference? No, no. Uh, what pastor? Which which one? GCN. I'll just show you. I'll just show you. GC. No. No, it was something that we organized here in Bangalore. Uh, we've got a. This was done just to help people kind of figure out. Uh, yeah, we got the flyer, pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one day event, but uh, we had a nice time. Uh, so, uh, so I was supposed to present on this idea, but of course I I couldn't even go through the first slide. So what we are doing is a new breed of Christianity, actually an old one, the original. That's the idea we are doing. Go back to the early church, draw the principles from what the uh, spirit led the authors to write, and bring it and practice it in our churches today. We don't want to go back to restoration movement. We are not interested to go back to uh, charismatic movement alone. While, while we need all those flavors, okay, I'm not against that. Those are all works of Christ, works of the Spirit. Uh, but what happens is we'll get stuck there. Or we don't want to go just go back to the Pentecostal movement. We're not wanting to go back to, before the Pentecostal movement, you had the Methodist uh, movement and then a couple of other movements and then the Anabaptist movement. And then before that, we had the, uh, the Reformation, of course, the Reformation is the la landmark movement. And uh, there are challenges with that. I think, uh, uh, Shubha, you're supposed to do that article, right? Uh, from piety to... Have you done that already, Shubha? Uh, no, Pastor. I had to do it. And that week, the class got cancelled because I... Yeah, was but you're ready, you're ready with it, no? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Okay. So, let's see. Uh, we can do something today on that. So, then I did... Uh, so, what happens now for us is... Uh, this is how it should be, the theological pyramid, the canon, that's our text. Then hermeneutics, exegesis, and then biblical theology on top of that systematic theology and practical theology. So what's supposed to happen is, sorry. Why is this happening with this? Mm, where is the sorry where are my controls gone one second something is gone wrong like go from current slide so So, um, it's a, it is going upwards. The process should go upwards like this. But what's happened today is, primarily, all theological institutions are only teaching this. So, what happens is, the theological institutions, the graduates of theological institutions, come out and teach us the churches, teach us the church, systematic theology. And what is systematic theology? Doctrine of God, doctrine of Christ, doctrine of Holy Spirit, doctrine of sin, doctrine of salvation, doctrine of demons, doctrine of end times. There are hundreds like that, okay? They teach us this, and the churches are filled with systematic theology. The problem in this is this is only one part of what Christ actually, which is actually the gospel. This is all primarily rotating around the gospel. But there is the Didache or the teachings, which is there in the uh, uh, in the Old Testament. Now we have a completely different set of teachings in the New Testament. That doesn't mean the Old Testament is out. Okay? Uh, that's called the Apostles', apostles teachings. Now, we the church has no idea of these. So we are basically pulled out the entire foundation out. Now, what we are looking at is biblical theology. And biblical theology through good experience 
exegesis and hermeneutics. And where do we get this from? The exegesis and hermeneutics of the canon. So you read the text, apply good exegesis and hermeneutics, develop good theology. Basically, what we are trying to do, we are trying to find the author's intended meaning. Okay, the author's intended meaning. So the first, the, the second author is, the second author is the human author. The first author is the Holy Spirit. All scripture is breathed by God. So uh, the first author is the Holy Spirit. So when we find through this exegesis hermeneutics process, the author's intended meaning, we understand what the spirit intended. So then when we read biblical theology, now what is biblical theology? Now systematic theology, you have pulled out all verses which has got God inside and you have stacked it with headings and subheadings. All who have read system, systematic theology understand what I'm saying, okay? So, but all the verses that are stacked under the title God is pulled out of its context. But when you stack it together, put headings, and when you read it like that, you get that kind of a theology out of it. And that's called systematic theology. The problem is, it is out of context. And if it is a Baptist or a brethren, their theology on certain topics will be different from a Pentecostal charismatic. So we, are, we have got theological bias or emphasis within our theology because of the way our traditions or denominations say it. Whereas biblical theology, what we are doing is we are reading it, reading the the books, the passages, in such a way, the books are placed in chronological order. So we have Paul's early letters, the middle letters, and the latter letters, the later letters. But if you see the, the canon, now it is in our Bibles, it is not arranged in this order. It's all mixed. So, but we need to read it in chronological order so that we will get proper biblical theology. So, you probably have Thessalonians, then Galatians, then you have uh, um, Corinthians, then you have Romans, and here you have Ephesians, you have Philippians, you have Colossians, you have uh, First Timothy, Titus, Second Timothy. That's how the sequence goes. Okay. So, um, uh, of course, here Philemon comes. And, uh, Ephesians. Philippians, Colossians, you have Philemon here. Yeah. So uh, when you read it in this sequence and you're reading it from verse 1 all the way to the end of the book, as you read it, you will have theology flowing out of it. That's called biblical theology. So you, the early church received the letters and they read it as they read it they experienced biblical theology. They understood biblical theology. So what did the early church get? They got biblical theology. They did not have systematic theology. Systematic theology is a post-Reformation idea. Okay? It's a post-Reformation idea. So this is our problem currently. This is our problem currently and uh, that's why the churches have all gone off the mill and they have so a lot of people with a lot of knowledge is there, but no life. Uh, there's a new belief. There is a new faith, but no new behavior. Because they have missed out on doing proper biblical theology. Now, if you do proper biblical theology, it's basically reading cover to cover. And preferably, try to get the Bible from Biblica, which has no chapters or verses. This is only for reading, not for uh, discussion, okay? Because you can't use that. Don't take that Bible anywhere because when the preacher says Colossians 5, so and so, you won't get the verse. They don't, know, they don't have verses. Why do you want to read without chapters and verses? Because they are, it, 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 it produces one nice flow without any bias because the chapters and verses came in the 12th century and in the 15th or 16th century. So the chapters came in the 12th century or from around that. In that. And the chapter verses came in the 15th or 16th century. So all of those were incorporated late, later. When the, when the original authors wrote it, you didn't have all those things. So if you take off that and read the text, 
and read it chronologically, you will get a completely different picture of the scriptures. And that's what these guys have done. Okay. Uh, any questions in this, what I'm talking about? Please feel free to ask me. So, so we can look at the dates which uh, the epistles are written and understand which is first and which is... Oh next. yeah, it, it's pretty now logical. You have Thessalonians, Galatians, some argument is there. But that's no problem because they both are talking about the gospel. Okay. These are guys are all, the first ones are all focused on the gospel. Okay. And yeah, you can do, uh, you can place Galatians first if you want. It doesn't make a difference because in this pool of uh, uh, books, the main emphasis is the gospel. In this, the main emphasis is the church and vision and mission of the church. In this is uh, the household, ordering the household and Christian leadership. So when you read it like that, suddenly you have, hey, you preach the gospel, you establish churches, you raise leaders. Awesome. It's beautiful, actually, if you see it. But you would never get it in systematic theology. Because in systematic theology, they won't make you read the Bible. They will make you read the theological, uh, systematic theology books. And they make you refer this verse out of context because they have quoted that verse there. So the verse is already there in the book. So they make you read it there. You don't want to go back to the Bible for that. But you're reading that verse out of the context. You're taking it out of what Paul has written. If you take it out of the, what Paul has written, imagine you have written a letter to your wife and uh, somebody else got the letter. Your wife read it, my wife kept somewhere, somebody got it. In that, you, men, you they take out one verse and use that against you. Is that, is that make sense? Makes sense. Absolutely. No, so in the same way, therefore, systematic theology, I'm not saying there's no value for systematic theology. There is. But if you have done good biblical theology, but you know, suppose, I mean, if you do good biblical theology, systematic theology or the, the, the concept of systematic theology or subject wise or topical, topical uh, theology, it basically systematic theology would be topical based. Or topical theology would automatically flow out of it. You know why? For example, uh, let's say uh, we have, we are all reading a, 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 a biopic of uh, James. Earl. Just imagine. And as we read uh, the biopic of James, sir, uh, James, sir, I don't know anything about your family or anything, but I'm just going to use as an example. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, as we read about his biopic, we will have a good idea of who, uh, a good idea of who James sir is. We'll have a good idea of Mrs. James, sir. Mrs. James. We'll have a good idea of his children because it's part of his biopic. You'll have a good idea of his uh, ministry. You'll have a good idea of his close friends, his associates. Now, it is coming out of having, of, out of reading his biopic, which is one continuous story, right? And out of that, as I am reading that biopic, oh, I have an idea of, because of all the events I went through and how James are. Uh, interacted with all those things, I have an idea of who James is. I have an idea of who his wife is. I know I have an idea automatically. But I don't need to, uh, you know, I don't want to read his biopic and then do a search on all the word James and bring it under one uh, uh, title, James, and then I would get a wrong idea, right? Because all, everything was taken out of context. But when I read it through and through, I, I form in my mind of an idea of who, what the character of James was. So, if you do good proper biblical theology, you will have a good understanding of who Christ is, who the Holy Spirit is. You will have a good understanding of what sin is, what salvation is, everything. You don't need to do biblical uh, systematic theology. You will automatically have topical understanding. Topical understanding. So, what is the thing? You need to have a good exegesis hermeneutics, know the author's intended meaning. And when you do this and through proper biblical theology, you will develop a good understanding of the topics. And once you understand this properly, you can apply it into life, which is called practical theology. Any questions? Anybody has heard a sermon on these things before? Uh, 
Why are they not telling you this? How many of you have heard the word biblical theology before? Or ever understood what biblical theology was before? No, coming here only, I, I came to know this whole term. But does it make sense? Isn't it, it makes that, a lot of sense. Lot isn't of it sense. that, it's like, isn't it like kind of a, a conspiracy thing that they have actually uh, kept away the greatest of all truths out of our picture? It sounds like something Ab like this. Absolutely. It, it, is, it is kind of uh, the enemy's tactic to divert everything into something else. Exactly. And that's how seminaries have gone into all kinds of problems that we are seeing today. So we have a lot, the problem, what is the problem now come out of all this? We have, let me get a good color. We have a lot of, we have a lot of messengers giving a message, but the messenger and message have no resemblance, no resemblance. But what Christ intended was the messenger to be the message. But here the messenger is giving a message. Uh, are we able to get it? Because the messenger only heard the gospel. He has not been taught to live and obey the gospel. Therefore, this messenger who has now had a new faith but not a new behavior is going and telling the message and the people hearing the message is looking at the messenger and saying, hey, what you're telling me and your life has no resemblance. But what Jesus wanted was the messenger to be the message. Can you see that issue? That divorce, this divorce is the problem that we are facing. The biggest ob obstruction to the processing of the gospel by the world around us, the biggest block to the people accepting the gospel is the, is the divorce between the messenger and the message. And because of that divorce, uh, the world is going to hell without Jesus. I think that was a little too strong. Anyway, that's a fact. I can't say it anyway. <laughs> Other way. So anyway, let's let's just proceed a little further. I, what I wanted to show was something different. Okay. Can you see how it is supposed to be stacked? What does the text mean? Is the exegesis. Biblical theology will give you the big picture of the story of the Bible. Systematic theology is what is true about God. Practical theology, how should we live? Now, can you do systematic theology without biblical theology and good exegesis? You can't. When you do all of this together, you get good historical theology. What have other Christians said? That means in history, what the scholars have said. Now, it's interesting. Our man, Jeff, who has created the course, gives you good biblical theology and good historical theology in that he gives you uh, a lot of scholars to read and tells you how to write an application, practical theology. This is actually systematic theology. All the ologies that you want is there on this. But anyway, okay. Now, here is what I wanted to actually show you all. We have to move the paradigm shifts from daily bread Christianity to the whole counsel of God. Are you able to get this? Yes, Pastor. Living by reading one verse and one small page of some experience or testimony or story with one small prayer is what most Christians today live on. I hope some more. now today's Christians don't even do that, but that's a different thing. But most of the Christianity lived on a daily bread. So what will happen? If I'm going to give my daughter enough water to just stay alive, I can keep her alive, correct? By just giving her enough water and little food, I can keep her alive. But she won't be able to move because her muscle is not going to function. Just move basically her eyes. But she will be alive. Now, daily bread is basically giving Christians just enough to keep alive. 
not thrive. Keeping alive and thriving are two different things. Do you agree with me? What did Paul tell in uh, Acts 20 at the beach of Miletus? He says, I have taught you the whole counsel of God. The kerikma and didakim. I've finished it. I've completely, I'm, I don't, I'm not responsible for any man's blood. I've finished my job. So we need a paradigm shift in our churches to move away from daily bread. I'm not saying stop reading daily bread. I'm branding a Christianity that lived on just two drops, uh, two, two glasses of water and maybe one, one bread a day. Kind of an idea. To a very healthy, thriving uh, church which has the full, whole counsel of God. How many of you agree with me on this? Yes, Pastor. That's true. Yes, Pastor. Let's look at the next one. Unfortunately, we have this division in our Bible called Old and New Testament. The damage it has done is crazy. And then we had a dispensationist come and say about the, you know, the, the dispensation of law and the dispensation of grace. And we literally trashed the old. But the Apostle Paul and Peter all spoke the gospel from the Old Testament. You cannot separate these two. This together would put up at the one big story. If you see it as one big story, everything changes. You will have good biblical theology. This has done a lot of damage to the church. We have a very skewed view of uh, Christianity or the faith because we don't respect the old. The gospel is embedded in the history of a nation. Let me repeat that. The gospel is embedded in the history of a nation. So that nobody can deny it. Nobody can uh, attack it. Nobody can contradict it. You can't see. You know, when Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister many years back, he stood in the UN uh, and he held the Bible up, uh, the, the, his Bible, the Jewish Bible. He said, this is my Bible. And it says in this book, in this Bible, there is a book called Isaiah. And he quotes Isaiah. And then he says, my people will come back to something he says. And he talks about it. What I'm saying is, um, the value of the Old Testament, it is the story of the people of God. And in that story, he has embedded the gospel. So you can tear the Bible, you can destroy every copy of it, but that as long as a Jew is on the on earth, you can't take it away. Are you able to get what I'm trying to say? I know it's, some of it may be a bit <laughs> difficult to digest, but just imagine if you see it. So if you had one big story, then we would not stop reading. We would not stop reading the Old Testament. Do you know that uh, at close to ninety percent of the people have no idea? Of the Old Testament. They have no idea. What was this what God did. That Genesis chapter 1 to chapter 11. Is like the background. And then from the story. Genesis 12, 12 onwards. Starts the whole. Uh, gospel story. And it climaxed. With the inauguration of the kingdom. With Christ. And the once the kingdom was inaugurated by Christ. Then it went on to being established. By the apostles. But if you see it in the whole story, then you will understand Paul's sermon, uh, Peter's sermon and Paul's sermon, how they spoke. And when they spoke the gospel, they spoke old and new together. There was no new that time in the first place. Okay. Are, are you able to see this? If we don't do it like that, then we will not get what Christ was speaking through the uh, spirit to the apostles and the apostles to the, teach, the ch church that was being uh, built. Does that make sense? Pastor. Preaching the gospel to adorning the gospel. Today we have, we are hammering our church people. Preach the gospel, preach the gospel, preach the gospel. But the Apostle Paul never told that to any of his churches. 
they told be the message he was telling adorn the gospel be the message i'm not saying preaching the gospel is wrong but when you adorn the gospel and you are the message they see you and they will ask you the reason for your faith that's what the, you know it says in i think peter i think or uh, i'm not sure if it was peter or uh, reason for your faith i can't recollect which was so we need to shift that paradigm we need to place the emphasis on living the gospel becoming the message and let us not divorce the messenger and the message this paradigm is so key one to one discipleship to church based discipleship today we have this whole concept of one to one i will disciple one person that person will disciple another person so it's the multiplication of disciples but the new testament doesn't talk about the multiplication of disciples it talks about the multiplication of churches and the discipleship is in the context of a church it was never done one to one Uh, well, how many of you agree with that one? It's a tough one, huh? I agree with first. It was a new learning for me when you spoke it last time. But don't you see that in the Bible? I mean, I, not uh, when when I'm saying it, James. Sir, I am looking at the scriptures and seeing that great, great, amazing truth in the Book of Acts and the teachings of Paul and everything. So I am coming to the conclusion of church-based discipleship compared to what we have as the one-to-one -one discipleship, where I am discipling one person. That person is only accountable to me. Yeah, that's a dangerous thing, isn't it? Everything done in the context of the church is what is uh, biblical. Yeah. Pastor leader to complex church network leadership. Today we have standalone single churches with one pastor. So let us see how it is. The Bible does not talk about a pastor. It only mentions the word pastor in the context of the Ephesians chapter four, the fivefold or fourfold ministry, however you want to see it. But that fourfold ministry actually is the apostolic offices, which is which presides over a number of churches or a network of churches or a cluster of churches. So this concept of one church, one single community with one leader was not a New Testament idea of church. It was, and it's not an idea of a leadership in the first. Place. There was the complex church network leadership, apostles and elders, apostles and the apostolic team being the itinerant community, taking care of all the churches, addressing the issues of the churches, teaching the churches, and also pioneering new works. And the other set of leaders were the local leadership, the elders, deacons. Uh, women leaders and other specially gifted leaders where do you see that today in the church you have only one how many of you seen the movie rambo the first blood you know it's a violent movie but of course very famous one actually i've seen pastor oh good excellent earlier earlier long back now i stopped seeing movies <laughs> <laughs> now it, it is a story of an american soldier who takes on the entire vietnam and russian uh, soldiers one single handed me so today's pastor is the cl cl classical american rambo soldier one i am the leader all of you are my subjects it's a kingdom one my kingdom mentality to what was the early church was a, a complex church network leadership so there were each community had elder they had uh, deacons that, that means it was a it was a it is a uh, pluralistic leadership or what we call as a um it was a uh, what do you call as multi leader multi leader uh, you know way of working there were many leaders over a church and these local churches were led by these elders and deacons but the church network of churches was governed by the apostolic leadership do we see that in the church today no now we see only one calling in the church first what is that pastor satish what is it what is that one calling this one man show i am saying <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it so, 
one man army yeah so isn't it dangerous are we moving away from biblical uh, paradigms so let us look at the next one when you come to the leadership leaders uh, manual no uh, that is what we will be learning mostly we will look at the complete structure of the new testament leadership it's amazing it will blow your mind off preach the gospel uh, incomplete uh, the great commission to the whole great commission what i am trying to say there is uh, we are telling the great commission is preaching the gospel so when we go and uh, uh, preach the gospel what happens we go preach the gospel give some track give one bible or put some bible somewhere or something we tell and we come back and we say we we have fulfilled the great commission you get off the the psychological state is that i have done the great work of god or the great commission whereas the the great commission is not ending there the great commission is going preaching the gospel those who respond you baptize then you bring them into the church and then you teach them you teach them jesus curriculum the curriculum of what jesus has given and they you have to teach them till they obey where and which church is doing that so i think we need to change that paradigm to just the, the preach the gospel in complete great commission to the whole great great commission don't you think that's an important paradigm if we actually obeyed the great commission the condition of the church would be completely different what do you think about that Yes, Pastor. When we do like that, um, the full knowledge they'll get the knowledge of Christ. They'll get the knowledge of uh, baptism and everything. Also, how to live your life by the gospel. By the gospel. Yeah. How every area of your life should change because of the gospel. How you deal with your wife, with your husband. How you deal with your children. How you need to personally guard your mind by pu uh, putting off and putting on, uninstalling the world and installing the go uh, the gospel. and then how do you uh, how does your heart dwell richly in god's word how does uh, how do you behave in your workplace how do you handle your finances what is your view of your finances how do you deal with your uh, neighbors how do you deal with the authorities and how you live under authority all of those the apostles taught where are we teaching our churches that you take the systematic theology books the greatest of them all and very few very very few have any doctrine taught on marriage but every believer in the church including the pastor and the apostle and the evangelist all have to be living marriage every day and when you don't teach the church or the people on how to live your marriage every day but you teach them the doctrine of god doctrine of sin doctrine of sin all of those things do you think that is of any value to it if he can't live his marriage fantastic pastor and it's true i agree with you so when we think of the great commission we think of going to some remote place struggle preach the gospel get a few saved and then die there that's what we think about right why does why did the missions fail all over the world with producing churches that are now deeply lost in sin because we only did the first part we preached the gospel we baptized them some of them and we brought them into a community that's all when we made peri peri christians i have i think i've told here before about peri peri christians no no pastor yes pastor yes pastor you told <laughs> shubha sister you have definitely heard me preach on that somewhere peri peri no pastor i remember that one where you got that packet of milk or something which was bloated and all no, that no, example no, 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 i've no. seen peri peri okay peri peri just for yeah, you then. shubha i'm going to speak I went to uh, McDonald's one day, and uh, with the pastor Elijah and others who taught you last time, no. And they first came to from Mumbai to Bangalore. I I have not met them. So when I went to visit the Whitefield Church, I took them out that afternoon for lunch. And for the first time, when I ordered for fries, they said, "Would you like to have peri peri fries?" I never heard of that. I said, "Yeah, I'd like to have it." So when they finally gave the serving, and I said, "Hey, this is just looks like regular fries." And she said, "No, no, 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 sir, you have to make it." I said, "I don't know how to make it," and. Uh, then what she did was there was a sachet she opened the sachet she dropped the fries into it and then she opened another small sachet with the masala in it she put the masala inside then she closed the mouth of the uh, the big sachet 
and then started to shake it. And then she said, voila, peri peri fries. So why okay. I am saying that is, today what we do is, one Sunday, the two hours, we do everything, whatever tamasha we can do, we will do that two hours. So that, somehow they will become Christians or liver Christian type. So it's just like the peri peri, I call it the peri peri, peri Christians. Okay. All right, so let's go to the next one. Systematic theology versus biblical theology. I did a detailed class on that. Standalone churches to global complex apostolic networks. How many of our churches are networks, part of a network? Not an affiliatory network. Not uh, go to an organization and say, can you give me uh, ordination and can you make me a uh, can you recognize my church? And then they will give you a, a seal and a certificate and they say, okay, now you're part of this, our network. Not that kind of network. I'm talking about a network that grew by growing, maturing, uh, raising leaders, sending out missionaries from the church, supporting them. They planting new churches, raising up communities, maturing. They growing. They sending out missionaries, multiplying, 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 multiplying. When then you have a network of churches, those complex are global complex apostolic church networks. How many do you know that way? Majority of the churches we know are standalone churches. We are working on it, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. But can you see the challenge we have today? Pastor, come again. Can you see the challenge we have today? The way we have moved away from the idea of Apostle Paul, who was the master builder of the church. I'm talking about a general trend. I'm not saying that there are no uh, authentic, organic church networks. There are. But I'm talking about the way we have drifted. We, we are repenting after reading the book of Acts. But... Amen. Now, let's say the brethren network. is a It's a puck. Uh, apostolic network organically grown multiplied all over the world and I think any of you are brethren here any of you are from brethren yes, yes pastor I am very much a brethren yeah so pastor uh, James sir you know uh, how authentic they have elders and they have I yes. don't think I have not heard about apostolic uh, no leadership. there is no apostolic network but uh, because every church is a super standalone church standalone <laughs> but then the network is there yeah you have a network but the problem then there is, it is an incomplete network because you don't have apostolic leadership. Exactly. Anyway, that, at least there is an organic network. Then there you preach the gospel, you bring them, you teach them, you really teach them. I, I know that. So that's good. <laughs> so let's go with the next one. Sunday school training of children to parents training children. Is that a paradigm shift? I know that it's going to be a little difficult to swallow this, but I'm going to do a little ex expanding. No, this is this is this is what is expected, but unfortunately, the parents leave the children, uh, you know, spiritual formation to this Sunday school. Yeah, so let, so one, I, I think I've shared it here. I had a, a sister come to me and ask me, Pastor, why doesn't your church have a Sunday school? I said I don't think it is needed. We had earlier. Uh, we stopped it, of course, of COVID, but I. We don't feel the need for that. What do you mean by that, Pastor? How can you say, my children will spiritually die? I said, I'll bury them. She got really upset. Then I said to her, I said, may I challenge you, sister? And I asked her, can you tell me where is Sunday school in the New Testament? The whole of the Bible tells the responsibility of training the children in the ways of God is the responsibility of the father and the mother. And today our outsourcing mentality has outsourced the training to the Sunday school. Now, I asked, are you saying that your child's spiritual life is going to be whole and complete by going to one and a half hour session where you half an hour you jump and dance uh, and uh, 45 minutes you jump and dance. Then the next 45 minutes uh, you teach Jesus, father is Joseph and Mary. And then you draw some colors and then you draw some pictures and you come back and you're saying your child 
will have spiritual life? She didn't say me a one word back. I asked, sister, are you having at least that one and a half hours in a week time with the Jesus? She said, no. I said, if you don't have that one and a half hours, what are you going to give to your child? And now you are blaming me for it. Then I gave her from Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 9, Deuteronomy 11. Then I took it from uh, Proverbs. I took it from everywhere and showed it is your responsibility. And I challenged her, you show me anywhere it is the church's responsibility to the children. With that, I ended the story. Case closed. Biggest paradigm shift we need today because if we are failing in this, we are losing the next generation. What do you think? I'm not again saying stop Sunday school, okay? I'm not saying not to read daily bread. I am not saying this we should stop. We need to rethink Sunday school. Sunday school should be a way of facilitating parents to teach their children. We should have Sunday school for the parents. Exactly. That's <laughs> what we have. So what we, what we, were, we, were, we were rethinking <laughs> Sunday school completely. We said for our Sunday school one and a half hours or two hours, let the parents come with their children. We in the church, the leadership team and the elders and the facilitators will facilitate the parents to teach their children. Yeah. And in the process, we will give them assignments which they need to do in the five days or six days that they have that the parents are teaching their children during the week. That's where everything is going to happen. Then we come together, the children come together and dance together, have fun, laugh, and then their fa father and mother and uh, fathers and mothers sitting together and teaching their children. Maybe in a group, a group of children sitting with a group of parents and they are discussing, not uh, shoving down the throat, but dialoguing. Because if you take Deuteronomy 6, you know the famous passage, no? Yes, yes. Let me the just take... The, uh, Sunday school was originally started for uh, the children outside in the neighborhood. But it was supposed to be an evangelistic idea, yes. Yeah. Then it became the soul of the church. These are the commands, the laws, and uh, the rules of the Lord, your God, told me to teach you. Obey these laws in the land that you are entering to live. You and your descendants, that is your children, must respect the Lord, your God, as long as you live. You must obey all his laws and commands that I give you, not some of them. Not whatever you like. Not a multiple choice. If you do this, you will have a long life in that new land. Then it says, Israelites, listen carefully and obey these laws. Then everything will be fine with you. You will have many children and you will get the land filled with many good things just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors promised. Does anything change from then and now? So far, what we read? Absolutely nothing. But today, Old Testament is outdated, right? <laughs> Listen, people of Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is the only God. You must love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Always remember these commands that I give you today. Be sure to teach them to your children. Talk. Can you see the word talk? First is teach. And then you need to talk about this. What is that talk? Is it me sitting and giving a lecture to my children? It's dialoguing. Talk about these commandments. What do you mean by talk? Hey, this is not some fanatical, sadistic God who is sitting there 
and giving us some rules that we must follow. We are called to do this because this is how we function. He created us. He knows how we are created. He knows how we should function. He knows how we should live together and we need to love each other. All of those things. So they, they need to talk about this. Why these commandments are important. Not shove it down the throat. Talk about these commandments when you sit in your houses and when you walk on the road. Talk about them when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them on your hands. Wear them on your foreheads to help. Now they literally did it. What a mistake. What blunder happened there. But <coughs> So write it on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Why did God ask them to do this? It is centered on the idea of teaching them to your children. Now you see one generation passed after this. What happened? Another generation came and they did not know about God. You'll read this in Joshua and Judges. Another generation came and they did not know about the Lord. Why did they not know about the Lord? Because they disobeyed this command. Be sure to teach them to your children. They didn't do it. This is the same mistake we are doing it. And instead of having a Joshua generation, we have a Judges generation. How many of you have read Judges? It's a nightmare. So, what do you think about my idea of Sunday school training of children to parents training children? Wonderful, Pastor. Then, let us go to the next one. Mission organization based missions to church based mission. I'm not saying we should throw away mission organizations. They should partner. Now, my church, if I want to send somebody to Thailand, in fact, I'm praying and you know, working with a, a missionary couple to send them to Thailand. It's a one person, less than one person Christianity there. After our Japanese church at Japan, I'm very passionately uh, you know, praying and saying somehow I can uh, get, but I, as a church, we don't have the expertise to teach that person Thai language. And so I have to partner with her. I may not have the funds to send a person there. My churches may not be able to afford that kind of a thing. Maybe I need a mission organization. But mission is a church thing. Mission organizations come to aid the church to fulfill the mission. But if you see, in the last 200-300 years, church does not do missions. Mission organizations do missions. Have we moved away from what Jesus originally intended? What do you think? We think alike. Let's look at the next one. Christian psychology to the first principles of Christ. Today we have this booming industry called Christian psychology. I'm not against it. I, I love it. I studied a lot of it. But you can't replace the work of the church wherein which they teach the new believers the first principles of Christ or what we call as the Didache or the teachings of Christ such that they uninstall the philosophies of the world and install the philosophies of Christ and that their framework of thinking is now fully gospel-centric. Then a lot of the psychological problems that today the Christian church has where we send them to Christian counselors and Christian psychologists will not be there. Pastor, can you come once again? So, you, I think you're all aware of a, a huge development within the church, not within the church, just outside the church, something called Christian psychologists and counselors. I'm a Christian psychologist and a counselor. Okay? I've done a lot of courses and verifications on this. 
But I have come to believe we are somehow outsourced discipling to these people. Because the church only preaches the gospel and push them into the church and every Sunday we do this tamasha. And somehow what pastors are trying to do is I will do a bigger and smarter tamasha, more colorful with lights and fly. I'm, I'm not against all of these things, but I'm just saying this is what pastors are doing. And then give this very flashy sermon so that I can somehow see that all my sheep will come next Sunday here because there is even a more flashier guy down the road. So I'm busy trying to be a flashy, strong, you know, charismatic preacher. I'm not teaching them anything. I need to spend a lot of time with my new believers to establish them in the gospel, establish them in the way of Christ and his apostles, establish them in the teachings of Christ and his apostles, that they will, they, they, they have come from the world, they contain their framework, their thinking framework is a worldly philosophy. By teaching them, you will uninstall that. I'm using a modern technical, uh, you know, software, hardware-based understanding of uninstalling. That's the best way we can understand. Uninstall this and install the gospel framework. So that then once I have a gospel framework, when I face the situations of the world, I will respond the way Christ would. The Bible says, I will have the mind of Christ. That means I will think like Christ. I will respond like Christ. And therefore, I will have healthy relationships. And therefore, I will not have relationship issues. I will not get hurt or create hurt. And therefore, I don't need psychology. Does that make sense? Anybody? Are you still not clear about this? Clear, clear. What others? What about others? Yes, I'm, not against, I'm not against Christian psychology. We need that. But they have a specialized role. These Christian psychologists must be people who are grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They themselves have understood the first principles of Christ. And yes, there are places we will need their help. But they must be under the leadership of the local church. Okay, let's go to the next one. Single man sermon to community learning participatory dialogue. Have you seen every Sunday the king ascends to the throne? Have you seen every Sunday uh, um, the sole actor How many of us packed pastors, we struggled to wait, said, Lord, please give me something to give to my people. I need a revelation. I need a fresh one. It's not a wrong prayer, but I don't think that's what the early church did. The spirit downloaded to the apostles. They wrote it down and they taught them this. And what they did was they taught and taught and taught the same things. Building that framework into the minds of the people. There is no fresh revelation. In the sense of, uh, there is of course, God can speak to you. And I'm not against those things. But from a solo single man sermon to community learning. When Paul, when Paul was in Ephesus and he was teaching in that night, late into the night he was teaching. Uh, and that guy fell off and you know, <coughs> Paul had to raise him from the dead. Do you know that that teaching was dialogical? You go to the text and you will see it. Go to the Greek and you will see it's dialogical. The early church practiced a way of discussing the teachings. They dialogued so that people would take ownership of the learning. Today, I can guarantee you the expiry date of the Sunday sermon is the benediction. Well, 
Whereas if you talk for 20, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, build a small framework, then get them to dialogue, they will remember it. They will own it. They will have to build an application on that. What do you think? I know this is a hard one. Anybody here? Any thoughts on this? Yes, Pastor. What you said is true, Pastor. After preaching so many times, some of them don't understand what we have said also. If you ask them, like, not, Sunday, what did I speak? Not asked. speak last Sunday, they'll say, Pastor, we don't remember. We have not asked them whether they have understood or not. Mm -hmm. And most of the charismatic churches only one thing. Preach a flashy sermon, prosperity, blessing, and then after the service, fire, 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 fire. That's it. Some of them fall down. Some of them something happens. Gets up, goes. Nothing changes. God is merciful. Some life, somewhere, something is happening. That's not what the early church did. Solo hermeneutics to church-based hermeneutics. I sit, I read the Bible. What God speaks to me in the Bible is the absolute truth. What happens if you do that? It's a, lot, a lot of it, what is happening in the church today? To church-based hermeneutics. As a church, we sit together. We read the Bible. We read it together or we read and come and we discuss together what the author's intended meaning is. What is the author talking about in this book? What are the different aspects of the subject that the doctor, doctor is, the, the, the author is talking about? And then we come to a common community understanding and draw as community, we draw the principles and we practice it mutually accountable to each other. <coughs> Sorry. What do you think? The symbolic communion to the family meal. There are, I believe, three idols in the church today. And all three are gods and worshipped. One is the pastor. Second is the pulpit and third is the communion elements. What do you think? That's true, Pastor. 100% true. And what do we go and do to the other people around us? Hey, idol worshippers. All idol worshippers. Gentiles. Pagans. Have you seen, uh, I'm not saying in all the churches, some churches they want to kill the pastor. But most of the churches, it is a reverential fear. Very reverential, very holy. Oh, praise the Lord, pastor. Some of them, I don't know, I'm afraid that any times... You know, God will, you know, send worms and, you know, I will die of being eaten by worms. Some of them, the way worship me. Then have you noticed the holiness around the pulpit? Nobody can come near that except God himself. Have you noticed that? All women are unholy, cannot one go near there. Then have you noticed the way we I have built the holiness around the communion elements. Have you noticed that people are more conscious of the communion elements than Christ himself? Even Jesus Christ, if he turned up in the church, he would have a complex that day. The three idols in the church today. I know that was very strong. Sorry. What do you think? Pastor, one more. Even a worship leader also became an idol now. Idol. Thank you for adding it. <laughs> so, I'm not against these, but these have lost balance because they are coming out of things that have recently come into the church. Whereas, for example, worship itself was catechetical in the first century. 
have you read that hymns uh, psalms hymns uh, new songs can you so do you know what context that was written it was written in uh, ephesians and i think in colossians in both contexts it was catechetical it is a part of the teaching methodology that the word of christ would dwell richly in their hearts am i correct Yes, pastor. Yes, pastor. Yes, pastor. But today, what is how is worship done? Is it catechetical or to stir up emotions? How much are people learning out of our songs? How much of it there is scripture in it, or at least uh, understandings of the scripture in it? Need not be exact scriptures, but it is. It has understandings or explanations of scriptures in it. In Tamil, Father Berkman's has written uh, the songs with the word, with the word of God. Mm -hmm. Do we That's use what... it? Do we use it for catechetical purposes in the church? Or is it only to stir up emotions? No, we use it for uh, to comfort ourselves first. Okay. So have you noticed the communion? How and I have observed this in my church, okay? They come there, they have this absolute piousness around at that time. Just 10 minutes before he was absolutely looking at the mobile, looking at everywhere, you know, it was not on any piety was there, not in that. But when suddenly the communion is announced and he then he moves towards, he has this absolute holy feeling is there. It looks like Jesus who was there in the church, he did not con was not at all conscious about. Was busy checking messages on the mobile during worship or during sermon. But the moment communion happens, he comes near that element, he stands there, he prays, it is so holy. And then he takes it. And how he does, takes it also is very interesting. Very, very minuscule. There's a huge bun there, but he will take that tiny little bit. And then he will hold it, he will pray, he will do so many th things with it. Then he will take the cup. I'm not against any of these things. What I'm trying to say is, have you observed this uh, dual life that we do within the church service where you are sitting a little time before where the worshipper said we are experiencing the presence of God. God's spirit is here, but he's busy playing with his mobile. But he comes to the communion table and becomes absolutely holy. What is the problem there? Don't you think that is an ideal there now? You have devotion everything to something that's only a physical element. What do you think? Is that making any sense? Do you see that kind of uh, thing in your, in your churches? Yes, Pastor. Some people are there. So, from the symbolic communion, to what actually happened in the early church was the idea of church was family and the family always ate together. I know this is tough and maybe, you know, people will throw you out if you go and tell this. Hall church to house church, paradigm shift. That means how it happened in the early church. We, we can have a hall church and have a proper family inside a hall church. That is possible. Led by a few anointed to a fully participatory, spontaneous spirit led uh, Sunday service. Sorry. If you read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26 onwards, what does it say? That's a picture of the New Testament service, right? Let me just put up that for you. Uh, so teaching alone cannot make them uh, strong in the spirit, no, Pastor. What do you have to do otherwise, brother? Pastor, can renew their mind, but strengthening the spirit? What do you need? Pastor, some, uh, there, are, there is a balance, no? In church, how, some churches, how, how, how do you strengthen the spirit? By reading the word of God. Not only word of God. Pastor, I, I can challenge you. Take the scriptures. Everywhere when the strengthening is mentioned, 
it is a scripture based because the spirit is the author of the scriptures. The scripture is backed by the author. And it is the primary tool for the strengthening of the inner man. Anyway, we'll argue that a little bit. One second, let me just, uh, I was supposed to show you something and I can't remember what it is now. I totally lost it. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I got it, I got it, I got it. Why am I doing this with you today? Otherwise, you may not figure out what we are trying to do in what we are doing. You should be able to capture these things, you know. So, you know that 1 Corinthians chapter 11 onwards is a description of the Sunday service or the whenever the church came together. Am I correct? Yes, Pastor. So at 14, of course, he, before this, he is discussing about the chaos that was happening in the Corinthian church. By the uh, There is a, a non-harmonious uh, or uh, unorchestrated display or manifestations of the spirit. Okay, so Paul is just saying, he's not against the manifestations of the spirit. He's saying you need to have order. That order is a free will issue. So he's saying you need to respect each other. So he talks that in the context of the communion. He talks about the divisions. And then he comes to one of the areas is giftings. And then he finishes all that and he comes to 1426. He says, so brothers and sisters. Interesting, he's mentioned sisters also. What should you do? When you meet together, when is the when do you meet together? What is the context? What, what is Paul talking about there? He says, whenever you, you come together, each what of you... No, no, Pastor, what is that coming together? Family. Any Christian gathering? Christian no. gathering. Paul was addressing the church. Church, okay, okay. It is not a generic gathering. It is not a loose gathering of believers. It is the church. When you meet together, so if you want a picture, now suppose we all feel, no, I wish we could have attended one of the first century churches. Well, Paul took a photo and put it here. Imagine you are in that room. When you meet together, one person has a song. Another has a teaching. And another has a new truth from God. One person speaks in a different language. Another interprets the language. The purpose of whatever you do should be to help everyone grow stronger in the faith. When you meet together, can you see this idea of repeated motive of when you meet together? It is the gathering of the church. And if you look at this, you see, of course, he goes on to address some important issues of uh, misuse or abuse. If you see, it is interesting that the, you can observe that there is a spontaneous, spirit-led, participatory, gift-oriented, ministerial setting, isn't it? Wow. I, I, I should write that down. What do you think? Anybody remembers what I said? It's there in the recording. Has to come again once, sir. I'm also struggling with that. I don't know how I said it. So it was...
yeah i would put it like this. when you meet together you are to uh, experience a spirit led gift oriented participatory contributory ministerial serving of the community that's what i see in this passage which passage you are ready when you meet together one person has a song one person has a teaching and another has a new truth from god one person speaks in a different language and is different people ministering gift oriented spirit led and participatory are you are we able to see that and the purpose of each ministry you do to help everyone grow stronger in the faith what do you think so led by a few anointed fully part, uh, anointed to a fully participatory spontaneous spirit led sunday services what do you think am, am i am i doing this stretching it too much is that what we see in the new testament No, Pastor, we are doing something else. It would be a great change uh, if we do that. First of all, we are not allowing Holy Spirit inside the church. So, paradigmatically, the New Testament, when we read it, it is different, completely the way things are worked. Anyway, gospel to letters, to letters to the gospels. And let me just share it with you. I'll close with this next two paradigms. We should finish it off. Gospel to letters, to letters to the gospels. Pastor, please explain this. What is this letters to the gospel? Very nice. At least I was thinking, if nobody asked me anything. <laughs> so, what was given to the church in the order of chronological? First, the churches received the letters of Paul. The gospels were written uh, almost several decades after the letters came to the churches. So what we are to do with the churches also today is teach the letters and then solidify it with the Gospels. What do we do today otherwise? We teach the Gospels. We don't even bother about the letters because most of the pastors don't even understand the letters. Whatever understanding of letters is, I can tell you very much, very easy it is. The only thing that we use the letters of Paul is, I can do all things in Christ Jesus. Or all the promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Or no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mouth has spoken what the Spirit has. You Have you noticed that we use only these standard statements? I have more than a conqueror. Ah, more than a conqueror. <laughs> Have you noticed that? But if we do what the apostles did, teach them the letters, then solidify it with the gospel. We'll argue that a little different later. Individualistic order, individualistic orderless versus ordered community and households. Seminary-based theological education versus church-based theological education. There was no seminary in the New Testament. The, the theological education was in the context of the church. Let us return to that. If we went through these close to uh, where 
actually start going. Ten plus nine, nineteen. I will return only nineteen. I think I can get another seven more or six more to make it twenty-five. If we experience all these, maybe close to nineteen, as would or what I have documented, paradigm shifts. What would happen? <clears throat> We have to go out of our present system. Yeah, that's one way to do it. Yeah, we have to completely erase whatever we are doing now. Okay. We have to change. We have to change uh, completely. What what do we say according to the biblical? But the people will oppose. But uh, we have to do it. We'll take a stand and we have to do it. Okay. Because when we do like this only, when uh, as you taught us, it's really great, amazing actually. Okay. Okay. Because we lost everything. Church has lost completely actually. Mm -hmm. We want to get back to the church mode, then we have to erase everything. We have to start afresh from the old thing. What what we said today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But a lot of uh, obligations, uh, so a lot of problems will be there, but we have to uh, explain to them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's more important. We have to explain them, uh -huh. we have to teach them. Then only, uh, definitely, how today we learning, we are uh -huh. learning, same uh -huh. way they will learn, and they, then only they will regret what the mistakes we have done in the church. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. After reading... Uh, uh, before I used to read, read uh, Acts, uh, but not uh, in such a way. I read nearly uh, nine to ten times now. After reading the Acts, uh, Acts, really a lot of things uh, we uh, we are not doing in the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you. If we... True, Pastor. But the thing is, the system is already habituated uh, to all these you know, so I don't mm -hmm. know. It's a big challenge to everyone because many theologians and many big, big pastors, uh, as you mentioned, uh, like communion and uh, other things, the pulpit, and, uh, they feel it as like very holy. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't allow even people in many uh, I mean, uh, places in Andhra as well. So mm -hmm. it's a big challenge to enlighten them. I don't mm -hmm. think so. They will feel the uh, same what we are feeling around right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one thing I like uh, what you said, I uh, appreciate you. Uh, we have to be a message. That is missing. Mm -hmm. That is really missing in the church. We have to be a message. When we are a message, definitely people will uh, come to Lord Jesus and uh, our, actually uh, the whole life will be changed. The whole life will be transformed. We will be a um, uh, 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 sorry, uh, live testimony in front of others. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That is missing. That is missing. Uh -huh. Being a message, it's uh, very important. Uh -huh. So that when people see our life, definitely they will change their life. Definitely they will accept Christ. Uh -huh. Okay. Anybody else would like to share? It is easy to say that we need to be a message than to be done, actually. It is very difficult. Mm -hmm. so, no, that's what we have, we have to do it. We have to practice. At least uh, uh, so for, to some extent, we have to try. Then God will help us. The Holy Spirit will help us. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Sir. Anybody else? So, first and foremost thing, don't take what I said down and go to a church and hammer it. Very, very dangerous. Don't do anything. You know me. I know you a little bit all and I have some relationship and I shared with you what would be the outcome of a long range teaching that we will go through. One. I just showed you the trailer. The movie is still there. Second thing is, I liked what uh, 
I think Pastor Silvester said, he said, what we are practicing is not biblical currently. I mean, it is some tradition, but may not be biblical, accurately biblical. So in that case, I would use the different phrase, and that can be very painful for most of us here, including mine, is that then it is unbiblical. If it's not biblical, it is unbiblical. Am I correct? The other thing is, when we are going to have to go and tell them these truths, some of my people whom I am now pastoring and caring for in my churches, some of them have come and told me, Pastor, you are the one who taught me this. You are the one who taught me this tradition. Now you are telling me all this is unbiblical. What kind of fellow you are? Now three years later again you will come and tell me everything is unbiblical. You see the problem? Yeah, but they should realize that you are also learning, right? And whatever new you are learning, you are you you are a gracious you, you, you are a gracious lady of the Bible, sister. But that doesn't nobody is merciful like that. So the idea that I'm trying to put, uh, sister, and all of you here is that these are truths what I just shared with you, and there is evidence in the scriptures. And yes, what many of our practices, I would like you to read Pagan Christianity by uh, Frank Weiler and George Barna. Worth reading. Please do that. Okay. Um, he's only t talking from a uh, local church perfect per perspective, but the apostolic perspective also is not there in his this thing. But still, worth reading uh, Pagan Christianity. It is a research scholarly work. It is not uh, someone writing whatever they want. So Frank Weiler and George Barna, try and read it. I will drop it in the group if you would like to read it. Okay. Now, so when we know this truth, when we have experienced this paradigm shift, one of the things that we need to do is we need to teach this with grace and teach it slowly so that people are able to experience that slowly are able to so when when i went through this whole last 5 6 years now i'm going through this process as i discovered the text and started doing fresh biblical theology and started looking at the scriptures in the way now we are looking at it and then i'm like lord my god 25 years lord i went through severe pain i struggled i said lord 25 years i missed it oh my god so many people I shared the gospel and I taught and I taught them all things that were not relevant. I'm not saying it's absolutely waste, but it was not. It didn't change their life. Many of the people that I shared the gospel with have fallen away, gone into cult, have left Christianity. Why, Lord? Why? I've cried. I said, Lord, I missed it. You know what I did first? I repented. I repented. I cannot blame anybody. I had to take that responsibility myself to repent. I repented and when I repented, I felt humbled and then I started to teach others with grace. I can show off with this new knowledge. I don't want to do that because I know that I messed up myself. I cannot, I have no right to go and tell somebody that they are wrong. I can teach them. I can share it with grace, leave it to their choice. I have to be gentle about this. I have to be caring. And I have to repent. Because I have taught so many people. And I have taught them just half knowledge, half truth. I have taught them traditions. I have taught them unbiblical traditions. I have taught them idolatry. In the name of Christian teaching, I have to repent. And I continue to continue to repent. So Sunny brother said, Pastor, it is almost impossible. So my my thought and uh, so Sunny brother, this is all good with due respect. Okay, I'm for argument's sake only. And I I understand Sunny brother your challenge. So my point is, if we know that this is the truth, and if we know and we are convinced that if we teach these truths to the churches, the churches will experience tremendous growth and be effective in the community. If we know that, 
then if we do not teach and if we do not develop the churches in this way, do you think when we stand before the Lord, he would ask us an account of the truth that he revealed to us? One. Second, do you think that if we do not take this truth as like we take the gospel to the pagans and the unbelievers, I think it is important for us to take to the truth, but teach it gently, speak, place it before them with respect. And I believe people will change. Not everybody, but some will come along. But if we don't do it, just because we don't want to shake the traditions or disturb the norms, then I think we will be called to judgment in the sense of not the judgment to banish to hell, to judgment to why our works did not make it through the fire. We cannot give a reason to... Uh, then why did John Huss and... Uh, what is that other guy? Um, famous uh, guy who was put to the stake, stake the, for the sake of the scriptures. John Huss. Um, that famous... Uh, uh, Bible guy. Wycliffe? Wycliffe? Why did they have to go to the stakes? Why were they put, burned in the stakes? Have you seen those movies? It's worth watching. Why were they burned at the stakes? Many more we don't know. Why were they burned at the stakes? Anybody? Why is nobody answering me? Did I, did I say I was not clear? John John Huss and John Wycliffe were people who uh, printed the Bible, translated by, held on to the truth of the Bible, moved it from Latin to other languages so people could, common man could read it. And they were people who were talking the truth at that time because they were given the revelation of the truth, uh, which was, you know, not clear in those dark ages. And they spoke it up so that the common man will hear. The church put them to death by burning them. But they were willing to risk their life. They in one of the movies, it's so beautiful, it says, please recant your doctrine and we will let you go. And they said, no, I will not recant my doctrine. They put him to the stake. They asked him even until the last, will you recant your doctrine? He said, no, I will not. Why? Why did they not do it? Because they did that. Yes. They did that and uh, uh, they want to, uh, they, sorry, uh, they told the truth. Exactly. They told the truth, truth. to the cost of their life. Cost of life. Are we not tell, able to tell the people the truth and that they fully experience Christ, the joy of knowing Christ, to have well-ordered life, uh, good marriages and good families, good workplace ethics and good community ethics and good uh, uh, full of good works. Isn't it that something that we should do? So that they can fully comprehend who Christ is. If we don't do that. And I believe we will stand before Jesus to give an account. Okay, we are close to our timing. Any comments and we can pray and close. Where did the system got affected, Pastor? Like, is it because of the, I mean, as Paul, everyone was continuing in these teachings, where did, when, when, how did this system got affected? There is no teachings now, no? Everybody teaches what they want, fresh revelation that they get. There is no ordered teaching. There is no ordered teaching in the church. 
No new believer is taught to change every area of their life based on the gospel. We don't have that. We don't have content to teach like that today. But now that we know the truth and we are being taught and trained and we are working together to study, and as we do that, let us not be afraid to tell the truth, even at the cost of our lives. Fantastic, Pastor. But let us do it with grace. It's like, you know, I, I, I think of it like this. All of us were blind. I was also blind. But I was given sight. Now I need to go and give sight to those blind around me. I cannot go around to the person sitting who are blind around me. Oh, useless fellows, all of you blind people. I'm the only guy who can see. Because I've forgotten that I was also blind. That is called pride. The pride of, you know, being puffed up with knowledge. But I believe that we should be humble. We should let these teachings transform of our lives and place it before our people with humility. Share them with what author's intended meaning was. This is what the Spirit intended. This is what the Spirit has written down for us. Let's not take words out of context. Let us read. Let us read together. Let us see what the Spirit was telling to the churches in the first century. Let us deal with humility. Why am I saying this? Because I know you can go and tell what I told to your churches and bash them. And I've done that. And I apologize for my church people. I apologize to them. Forgive me. I, I was became proud with my knowledge. These revelations were powerful to me. And I came and hammered it on all of you. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I went before God and I asked for sorry. For first repenting that why I never knew the truth. And the truth was before me. Then I went and repented again. Lord, why went and bash my people with all these truths that you revealed to me? Please teach me humility. I want to be humble, Lord. Okay, can I ask one of you to pray? Pastor Victor, would you pray? Thank you. Dear Holy Spirit, we come before you. There are many things that you have challenged us today. Lord, some of the things we are yet to get a grip on, but we are challenged, made to think that certain things, what you want us to change, even our forms and practices. Lord, different things that you have been speaking to us. Some of the things which are not easily palatable to us. But we submit ourselves into your mighty hands and we ask you that even as we minister to our own people, we may be Lord humble, we may have the grace to be a message first than to give a message, Lord. Help us that we may be gentle, we may be able to feed, we may be able to tend to the lambs, feed the sheep. With your grace, with your love. And Lord, even many of these things which we pondered upon today, about the paradigm shift that, Lord, you would like to bring into our life and ministry, we ask you that you would give us the grace to Lord, linger on, hold on to, wait for you to do it in our own lives and then in the church, Lord. We thank you for this wonderful time of learning. We ask you that you bless each one of us. Bless Pastor George especially and every one of us. All those dear ones who have spent their time at their workplace, tired but yet made a sacrifice to be here. Lord, bless them. That your grace will work in us more and more and that we will be, Lord, leaders after your own heart. Lord. We thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name.
Amen. 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 If any of you have difficulty, please uh, feel free to talk to me whenever time you get free. You can call me. Don't carry any of these things too heavy on your head. I just shared it with you because at the last, when we finish this course, you will hold all of these convictions very strongly. Okay? God bless you. Bye-bye. God bless you all. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Good night. Good night. Bye.